The journey along the Green Rhine is the story of the inhabitants' love of their river, but also of man's arrogance, an excessive belief in technology, and the unbridled force of water. It's the story of man and nature, both in harmony and in conflict. From Lake Constance, the route first takes us to Basel. We continue north past the Alsatian metropolis of Strasbourg. After 500 Rhine kilometers, the journey ends at the so-called Island Rhine near Mainz. At Rhine kilometer zero, the river leaves Lake Constance and heads west. The section from here to Basel is called the Upper Rhine. Over a large area, it forms the border between Germany and Switzerland. This part of the Rhine is not navigable for industrial shipping. Here, it has still retained its original character and resembles a mountain stream. The Swiss town of Stein am Rhein marks the first stage of the journey along the Upper Rhine, an ideal starting point to become acquainted with the river. I love gliding through the water. It's totally relaxing and it clears your mind. I just love it. It's so much fun. I've even solved math problems that I couldn't do at home in the water. And then I went home and wrote down the correct answer. But the Rhine not only helps solve problems, Jenny needs to know exactly what she's doing when she dives into the river and what she needs to avoid. Jennifer Glogg is a swimming coach for the Swiss Life Saving Society, and that's precisely why she has great respect for the river. It's a friend that can quickly become an enemy. Basically, the main difference is that we have a current here, and that can be really dangerous. So you always have to check first, where exactly is the current? So that's what I do before going into the river. There might be rapids that could drag me down, depending on how strong they are. You might not be able to resurface. It's not a proper swim without a Rhine jump, which is always a risk. How deep is it down there? Can I dive in there? Jumping off a bridge is different from jumping off a diving board. When you dive from a bridge, you first need to check behind and in front, in case there's a boat coming. It's important to make absolutely sure there's nothing in the way. Then I usually wait a little while, just in case there's something under the bridge that I didn't spot. The quality of the water is one thing Jenny doesn't have to worry about. The water is cold but clean. The middle of the Upper Rhine is a raging torrent with a speed of up to three meters per second. There's absolutely no use fighting it. Jenny always tries to use the river's force to her own advantage. She swims with the stream, not against it. I'm actually very fond of the Rhine, of water in general. Of course I'm aware that there are branches, algae and animals that swim around me, but it's just a totally different feeling from being in an outdoor swimming pool. A swim in the Rhine means walking back to where you left your clothes. In the towns along the Upper Rhine, people running around in their swimming costumes are a common sight.
After Stein am Rhein, the journey continues downriver to the Rhine Falls at the city of Schaffhausen. At 23 meters, this is Europe's highest waterfall. At no other point does the Rhine demonstrate its force so dramatically. It makes it endlessly fascinating, but also a little frightening. Tourist boats battle in vain against the surf to reach the middle rocks. Climbing them is the highlight of each trip. But on days like today, the high water level makes it impossible. The Rhine Falls are impassable for boats. Once, this was what brought wealth to the town of Schaffhausen. Boats had to be unloaded before reaching the Rhine Falls, and the goods were transported overland. The transfer of goods was facilitated by the Weidling, a flat boat that still plies the waters today. It's unmistakable as the Weidling isn't rowed, but is poled along. With two so-called spikes, the rowers propel their boat upstream. The Rhine and the city are inseparably linked. For me, the Rhine is far and away the most important thing about Schaffhausen. In summer, you're always down by the Rhine or going for a swim. Without the Rhine, it would just be boring here. People who grow up here have a special relationship to the Rhine and to the Weidling boats. My grandfather used to run a boat service and he passed it on to my father. Now it's my generation's turn. Lukas Hegertschwiler and Jan Kind are cousins. To them, the Rhine is more than just scenery, it's part of their heritage. In summer, they spend all their free time down by the water with their Weidling boat. A lot of families get together and share a mooring. After all, you can't spend all your time on the river anyway. And when there are more people, they can really make the most of it. The waiting time for a Weidling mooring is about 25 years. Most mooring sites are passed on from one generation to the next. The important thing is that it's operated manually, without an engine. And that's what's so nice about it, propelling the boat by relying on your own muscle power and spending a nice day together. It's important to always use flowing movements, to go to the front, stand on the base, and then plunge the pole into the water and push. It's tricky when the water level is quite low. Then you have to go pretty far out into the Rhine, and there could be hefty side currents. If you don't react quickly enough, you end up turning around in circles. The Upper Rhine is one big bathing area. The water is comparatively clean. There are no factories, no cargo boats, no sewage. After an hour of boat poling, Jan and Lukas cross to the opposite bank. They're meeting with friends for a barbecue in the forest on the other side of the Rhine. Mm. 
Lukas and Jan will soon leave Schaffhausen to go and work in a larger city. But thanks to their family-owned Weidling, the two cousins will always come back here again. Beyond Schaffhausen and the Rhine Falls, the route continues west down the Upper Rhine. On the horizon, the Swiss nuclear power station in Leibstadt blows off steam. It's no coincidence that it was built right here on the banks of the Rhine. In the cooling tower of the power station, cooling water is constantly evaporating. Each second it is replaced with a thousand litres of Rhine water. The inhabitants of the border town of Bad Zeckingen know how powerful the Rhine can be. Flooding and ice have frequently wrecked the bridge that leads over to Switzerland. But then the people of Zeckingen reinforced it with stone pillars and a roof. Today it's the longest covered wooden bridge in Europe. A little further downstream, next to the hydroelectric plant Rheinfelden, a unique fish ladder was constructed. Over a distance of 900 meters, salmon and graylings can swim upstream, avoiding the dangerous turbines of the power station. The gravel banks prove an ideal spawning ground. Basel at Rhine kilometre 170 is a metropolis on the tri-border area of Germany, France and Switzerland. The third largest Swiss city has benefited greatly from the Rhine since it always provided a fast traffic route up to the North Sea. Trade brought freedom and wealth to the people of Basel, still evident when you see the quaint townhouses and the cathedral on the hill overlooking the Rhine. The liberal atmosphere here has always attracted intellectuals and artists. A string of more than 30 museums lines the city, like the Vitra Design Museum here. But the city was not always good for the Rhine. After an incident at a chemical plant in 1986, 20 tons of toxins contaminated the river. The water turned blood red and traces of chemicals were detected as far away as the Netherlands. It was one of the worst Rhine disasters, as well as a wake-up call against the abuse of water as a resource. This change in attitude is exemplified by the history of the Riebadhusli. For over 125 years, the public swimming baths have been located a few hundred meters east of the old town, right on the riverbank. Every morning, the manager, Hugo Boozer, personally opens his swimming baths. I love the atmosphere in the morning. When I come here at 8 o'clock, I'm usually alone. I can have a coffee, sit up here and gaze out across the river. There's often a slight breeze and I can take in the colours. When the sun comes out, it's amazing. And it's right in the middle of the city. And then, of course, this platform. There's something almost magical about it. Even in summer, the water here on the river is always slightly cooler due to the tributaries from the mountains. But the people of Basel go in for a swim when temperatures reach 18 degrees Celsius. 
the current water temperature is a constant topic of conversation. Ribad Hisli isn't a closed swimming bath, but a platform over the river. It's a popular spot for sunbathers and an entry and exit point of the Rhine. A few years ago, after the chemical plant incident, the baths were going to be closed down. At the beginning of the 90s, the demolition was approved by the government. It was run down, a gigantic wooden construction. Back then, there was a floating floor that could be adapted to the water level. It was a proper swimming bath, but it had rotted away, it wasn't being properly maintained. Swimming in the Rhine was no longer fashionable, nobody wanted to swim in the river anymore. So the chemical plant had to do something to win back people's trust. After that, the water gradually became cleaner. It was a turning point for the river and the Bad Husli. A local interest group prevented it from being demolished. Hugo was assigned to create a symbiosis between bathing fun and gastronomy. I do think that it's a meeting place for the area. People come here and socialize. Some people learn how to swim here and they still come today. We want to preserve this place as an iconic location, in the sense of it being authentic rather than trendy and open to all. Hugo's aim is to make the city dwellers more familiar with their river. A few years ago, he initiated a music festival on a raft on the Rhine. And here, he really came into his own. It's something new. It captures the spirit of the times, the Mediterranean way of life that develops around the Rhine. People used to go swimming in the Rhine. But when I was young, we didn't really spend a lot of time by the river. Today it's different. You go there to read, relax, meet other people. And in the evening, you go for a meal at the Rhine baths, which are open till midnight. It's great, a lot of fun. Life with, rather than against the river. Hugo Boozer's swimming baths symbolize the new zeitgeist by the Rhine. The old Basel Rhine ferry is in keeping with this spirit. It's propelled by the current alone. But it's precisely here, at Basel's Rhine knee, that the Green Rhine changes its character dramatically. The tamed Upper Rhine is where industrial shipping begins. At the beginning of the last century, the French Rhine Canal, parallel to the Old Rhine, cleared the way for ships. It flows through an enormous system of barrages, locks and power plants. Renowned architects like Le Corbusier worked on the project to subdue the Rhine. The lock in Kemp's is his work. The many straightened sections shortened the upper Rhine by 80 kilometers. The river became faster and dug its way deeper and deeper into the ground. The countryside around the old Rhine pastures began to dry out. Consequently, the danger of flooding increased, the downside of progress. From Basel, all other traffic routes follow the new direction of flow. Instead of going west, they now head north. On the German side, the Black Forest is the Rhine's backdrop for more than 200 kilometers. Beyond the peak of the Blue Mountains at the edge of the Black Forest, 
The Rhine Valley extends with the Vosges Mountains on the horizon. Since 1895, the steel platform has offered stunning views over the Rhine Plateau. Near Freiburg, the Kaiserstuhl, Emperor's Chair, rises up out of the Upper Rhine Valley. The inactive volcano is Germany's sunniest spot, making it a perfect wine-growing region. The terraces are a landmark of the area. At the foot of the Kaiserstuhl, the Rhine side canal reunites with the old Rhine and encounters a network of watercourses, islands and riverside forests. The floodplains in Weisweil and Taubergießen have survived the straightening measures of the past 200 years. They prove their worth during floods. The humid forests absorb the water masses like a sponge. The Rhine broadens, rather than creating a threatening wave in its concrete bed. Having got rid of the floodplains in the past, river engineers are now planning to re-naturalize the old pastures to create new ones. The discovery of the important role of the Rhine pastures brought with it the recognition of their true worth. Really, the most amazing thing about nature is how fascinating and diverse it is. On a patch of five square meters, you may find 20 different plants, all of them edible. So nature provides nourishment all year round. As a child, Carolina Höfken spent a lot of time in the riverside forests. She only rediscovered them a few years ago, as nature's chemists and grocery. Himalayan balsam, the seeds are safe to eat. They're the ones you would put in your hand as a child and then they would burst. You can eat them and the flowers as well. You shouldn't have too much though, because they have a laxative effect. But taking a few seeds or flowers for a salad or sandwich, that's fine. And they taste a bit like peas, really tasty. There are many plants that help Carolina identify Weisweiler forest as an alluvial forest. A distinctive thing is that they are alluvial forests, which means they are naturally humid. The types of trees here are quite characteristic. There are many alder trees, poplars and ash trees. They're the ones that thrive on damp. Other forests are always cleared as they're strictly working forests. And here you can see dead wood lying around everywhere. And vines are also typical of a Rhine forest. Collecting, testing, identifying. On these forays through the forest, Carolina's taught herself most of what she knows. The more species there are, the more often you find something. If I'm just collecting chanterelles or dandelions, then it's more difficult than collecting, say, a hundred different mushrooms and a hundred different plants, because then I don't have to look out for them specifically, but just come across them again and again. Wild garlic and pilewort in spring, buds, seeds and mushrooms in summer and autumn, and lamb's lettuce in winter. In future, Carolina aims to be completely self-sufficient with what she finds in the woods. If I could, I would live in the forest. It just makes me happy. I can really unwind and it takes my mind off things. Headaches just vanish. If something is troubling me, I find a solution. I really think I could live in the forest. At the end of her walk, Carolina reaches the Rhine Harbour in Weisweiler, where her father used to moor his boat.
Der Rhein, ja, das ist einfach, the Rhine is where I spent my childhood. I'm drawn back here all the time. I feel the same way I did as a child when I came here with my parents. So it's a very nostalgic thing for me. It was her childhood memories that brought Carolina Höfgen back to the unspoilt banks of the Rhine. For her, it's a way into the future. Downstream, along the border between Germany and France, Alsace extends on the left bank of the Rhine, the countryside between the Rhine and the Vosges Mountains. The Chateau du Haut Königsbourg lies at the eastern edge of the Vosges. It was painstakingly restored under Emperor William II as a symbol of German national pride. But then came the First World War. The castle passed to France. For centuries, the Germans and the French battled over the region. partly for supremacy over the Rhine, over trade routes and trading posts. In a hundred years, Alsace changed its nationality four times. War cemeteries like the Blood Mountain in Siegolsheim commemorate the past. Here lie 1,589 Frenchmen who lost their lives in 1945 during the last battle over Alsace. At Rhine kilometer 292 lies Strasbourg, the metropolis of the Alsace. The city was an eternal bone of contention between the two arch enemies, Germany and France. The hatred between these neighboring countries only ended after the Second World War. Since then, Strasbourg has belonged to France. Today, it's a symbol of European understanding. Strasbourg's Rhine port is France's second largest inland port. For a long time, it was the bitter rival of Kiel, its counterpart on the German side. Since the war, the port authorities have worked together. The final section of the Rhine canal system lies beyond Iffitzheim in the district of Rastatt. With the increase in shipping and water power, the Rhine has now doubled its speed compared to the past, which means flooding is a particular worry here. Facing the port of Lauterbourg, bang in the middle of the risk area, lies the Aubourg du Rhin, a restaurant owned by the Schwartz family. The house was built in front of the dike over a hundred years ago and has been flooded almost a dozen times since. The Schwartz family have got used to regular flooding and are even modestly proud of the water levels they've recorded. We have learned to live with the floods. The house is right in the middle of the risk area, so the insurance doesn't pay when we get flooded. We have to foot the bill. Richard Schwartz and his son Damien reach the restaurant via a small jetty. It's their emergency exit during the floods. During the last flood, we had a gala dinner on when the water started flooding the restaurant. We had to clear out immediately, clear the tables, unplug the machines and carry everything outside. And as soon as the water is gone, everything has to be cleaned. You need to get on with it immediately. The restaurant has been family owned since 1952. Damien wants to take over in a few years, despite the flood risk. 
the love of water runs in the family. My father was a diver. He always loved the water. That's why he chose a restaurant right on the bank of the Rhine. And our holidays were always spent at the seaside. And we always ate fish, fish, and more fish. For the past 30 years, chef Richard Schwartz has represented the Alsatian way of life. Here, the true classic is a fish from the Rhine. The pike perch. I like eating pike perch myself. I eat it a lot. It's served in all the restaurants here. Fried pike perch served with a moral almond sauce. The reputation of the fish restaurant au bord du Rhin has spread across the border to Germany. In summer, more than half of the guests come from the opposite bank of the river. I'm really attached to the river. It's so wonderful to take a break for a few moments and enjoy the Rhine, even if it's just for a couple of seconds. It's instant stress relief. Then you're ready to go back to work. Marvelous. Richard and Damien Schwartz wouldn't dream of giving up their outpost on the riverbank. Even though every few years, they pay dearly for sticking so close to the Rhine. One thing the expansion of the Upper Rhine has achieved, the river is now navigable from Switzerland to the Netherlands and has become invaluable as a transportation route. At Loch Iffetsheim, at Rhine kilometre 332, the route returns from the French to the German side. Here, a vast system of islands and Rhine pastures extends northwards. The Illinger Old Rhine is the largest old tributary south of Karlsruhe. It's a haven for aquatic birds. Cormorants, ducks, swans and storks, occasionally even osprey make an appearance. Many come from northern countries to spend the winter here. And so the area is also paradise for bird watchers. Bird watchers who don't mind lying in wait in a camouflage tent for hours. For 10 years, Arno Helfer has been documenting bird life along the Old Rhine and the abundance of life which the river brings forth, if left to its own devices. One of my favourites is the kingfisher, because they're quite rare. You don't get to see one of those every day. They're also slightly peculiar. Other than that, I also like swans. 
They're always different, with a variety of poses, and they're not so easily scared off. Summer flooding has inundated the road at Fierkopf. For the alluvial forests, it's no catastrophe, but a normal part of their life cycle. For the photographer, it's an opportunity to get even closer to his motifs. The less there is in the picture, the better. I like it best if you just focus on the animals, or a particular atmosphere. Arno Helfer can be seen in the Rhine pastures all year round, here in the wilds of the so-called Jungle of Baden. Nature is still practically untouched here, you could say, but civilization is only a few meters away in the other direction. search for the perfect Rhine photo leads Arno deep into the forests. When the flood marker rises, the willow trees are often in the water for months on end. Almost two dozen protected bird species live along the steep riverbanks of the waterways among thick reeds and rushes. Some of them, like the kingfisher, are rare as well as timid. It takes patience to find these loners. I usually just set off and then I'll feel drawn to a particular spot and I'll stay there, usually for a long time, say three, four hours. The big moments aren't a question of technology. Patience and intuition are the recipes for success. Like today's long-awaited debut. The young storks flew out for the first time today. From the water it looks so beautiful when they come in to land again on their nest. The white stork was already extinct here. But due to the renaturation of the Rhine pastures at the beginning of the millennium, it returned to its favoured wetland. For the particularly timid Rhine birds, more than patience and luck is required. The only thing that helps is to become invisible. In more and more places, the Rhine is regaining its original appearance. This also benefits people who can find new places of recreation by the river. The further north the journey goes, the more dense the shipping traffic. The Rhine is the busiest waterway in Europe. Near Ludwigshafen and Mannheim, at Rhine kilometre 419, Rhine and Neckar converge. The second largest German inland port extends over a length of 14 kilometres. In the 70s, a new basin was created here for the chemical industry's hazardous substances. It was preceded by a disastrous tanker accident. When such accidents occur, the congested channel is easily blocked. A special Rhine boat regulates traffic on the river.
The diving bellboat Carl Straat patrols the route from Alsace to the Netherlands. From the stern of the platform, a steel diving bell is lowered to the bottom of the Rhine. It's actually a salvage vessel. We recover obstacles like containers or boulders from the Rhine and all sorts of other things that don't belong there, cars that are pushed in from the military rams. We also retrieve those. Captain Thomas Bach has worked on board the diving bell boat for the past 13 years. A ship has lost its anchor, a typical mission for the salvage vessel. The captain steers the boat to the spot on the Rhine where the anchor was lost. Here, the diving bell is lowered on a solid steel cable. In an airlock, the workers must first get accustomed to the higher air pressure. Working in compressed air as we do is twice as exhausting as if you were doing the same work under normal conditions. In the evenings, your body feels tired, and when you flop on the sofa at home, you're out like a light. As soon as the bell is lowered into the water, compressed air is pumped in. The bottom of the bell is open, and the excess pressure eliminates the water at the bottom of the Rhine. The men are able to work down below without getting their feet wet. It's a seven meter descent to the bottom of the Rhine via the shaft pipe. I'd never have thought that the Rhine was so clean down here. It's constantly in motion, so the stones keep on rolling. That's why they're always so clean. Once we found a bottle that fell apart like a piece of paper, as it had been rolled along so much that it disintegrated. Now the actual search for the anchor begins. Captain Thomas has the diving bell raised slightly. The working conditions in a diving bell are pretty extreme. In winter it's cold down there, and in summer it's hot and very humid. The diving shaft heats up and transports all the warmth downwards. So if, for example, it's 24 degrees up here, then it's 30 or 32 degrees for the men down there. Once the lost anchor is found, the bell is again lowered onto the riverbed. Work on the riverbed can be risky. Flotsam and things like that get caught behind port entrances and under jetties. And once, about five or six years ago in Eltville, we had a bomb. It was just rolling around while we were working down at an anchorage. The diving bell can heave up to 15 tons from the bottom of the Rhine. The diving bell boat, which is unique in Europe, is already 50 years old. But for Thomas Bach, each trip is still like a journey to the moon. It's strange because you're walking on a piece of earth where no one has ever set foot before. It's new each time. Keeping this part of the earth clean 
is an important mission, even if no one else will ever get to see it. At Rhine kilometer 500, there are two county capitals. Mainz on the left bank is the seat of government of Rhineland-Palatinate. And only a bridge away on the opposite side of the river lies Hessian Wiesbaden with Biebrich Castle. The last section of the Upper Rhine is called Island Rhine. In summer you can often see a legend hovering above it. Junkers U-52, nicknamed Auntie U, the Grand Dame of German aviation. These flights over the Rhine are always fully booked. It's really one of the most beautiful routes you can imagine. Even for us, it's most impressive to fly along the Rhine. The landscape here is so diverse and so full of contrasts. For Georg Spiet, who normally works as a general aviation pilot, the U-52 is more than just a hobby. For the modern pilot of today, it actually means getting back in touch with the roots of flying. It's the original way of flying, battling the forces of nature directly. You have to use your own strength to steer. It's a bit of an adventure, and I think that's what every pilot is after. Not far from Mainz lies the small airfield Finten, here, the Junkers planes take off and land. The U-52's distinctive feature is its corrugated duralumin metal skin. Captain Georg Spiet is one of only 25 pilots in Germany who are permitted to fly the Junkers. What's special about these old planes is the smell. It's a mixture of oil and fuel. And you only get that with these old machines. I once took my mother-in-law along. When she was a child, she experienced how a Junkers 52 had to make an emergency land in a field in East Prussia. And she was allowed to go there with her school class and have a look at the plane. So when I took her with me, she said, Georg, it still smells like it did back then. Georg, das riecht noch genauso wie damals. The Junkers became famous during the Second World War as a solid and sturdy transport aircraft. I mainly experienced at flying jets, and the U-52 suddenly seemed like a gigantic suitcase that was a bit clumsy to handle during curves, and I required the use of a lot of different rudders. But after a while you get used to it, and when you learn how to operate them it's really fun. Then it's almost as if you're flying them with your mind. You think about the next left turn and the plane is already flying it. <laughs> the 
People love the experience of doing these turns over the river and the fact that you can see it down there and say, OK, that's where we live, it's where we belong, and now I can see it from a new perspective. Flying over the Rhine with the U-52 is typical of the newfound respect for untouched nature. After frequently going off on the wrong track, people have realized that technology and the river must always be in harmony.